So what belongs to God? This is the question we're left with at the end of this passage from Matthew. What are we to give to God? What are God's things? In this passage, Jesus, as he often does, he turns what appears to be a straightforward yes or no question on its head. And he leaves his listeners with a far more complicated answer to ponder than I think they were banking on. It always makes me laugh a little bit. Like, did they honestly think, did the Pharisees and the Herodians honestly think they were going to trap Jesus, that they were somehow going to trip him up? They knew, they had to know, that this was not going to end well for them. The Pharisees and other religious and secular leaders had tried to test Jesus on multiple occasions, and it had never gone well. But they tried it anyway, and it ends the way it always does for them. And this always makes me think of Wiley Coyote. Like, no matter how many products he bought from Acme to catch the Roadrunner, it never worked. Always the same outcome. I feel like these folks should have figured that out by now, but they try it anyway. So what is it exactly that they're trying to get Jesus to say? What's the trick? What is it about this question? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What in that question could lead Jesus to entrap himself? Why is this such a fraught question? Well, it's important to understand, first of all, who these two groups are that have come together to pose the question, because I will tell you these groups normally would not be together. The Pharisees and the Herodians had very different ideas about things. They certainly had different ideas about this tribute tax to the emperor, but really about most everything else. They were on different sides. They were very unlikely partners in this endeavor. So to the Pharisees, paying this tribute tax was heretical. They didn't want to give financial support to this polytheistic pagan emperor who made their lives somewhat difficult. They didn't want to pay tribute to someone who considered himself a god. There's only one god, and it's not the emperor. But to the Herodians, paying a tribute tax was, well, your civic duty. They would have seen a refusal to pay it as an act of sedition. So these are really strange bedfellows plotting together to entrap Jesus. So given this, the question they ask seems like a lose-lose situation for Jesus. If he says, yes, you should pay the tax, the Pharisees can say that he's then not loyal to his own people. If he says, no, you shouldn't pay the tax, the Herodians will say he's disloyal to the empire and has committed an act of sedition. They figure they have him trapped either way, lose, lose. They bought the wrong product from Acme. Because Jesus does what he often does in situations like this. He flips it right back on them. If that's Caesar's likeness on the coin, he says, then give it to him. Give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. There you go, Herodians. And give to God what belongs to God. There you go, Pharisees. I wonder if they aren't more perplexed by this answer than amazed, as the text says. The text says they were amazed, and I think of amazed as people going, wow, that is amazing. I don't think that was their response. I imagine them more kind of looking at each other, shaking their heads, maybe shuffling off and mumbling about how they did it again. They got caught in their own trap. Again, they have been outwitted and left to wonder by Jesus. What exactly did he mean, in particular, about giving God what belongs to God. Well, it's interesting to note in that what Jesus doesn't say in his answer, because that helps us understand it a little better. Jesus doesn't say that there are these two distinct realms, the religious and the secular, the empire and the church, and that they require equal fidelity. He doesn't say that what's given to Caesar and what's given to God are equal two sides of the same coin, you might say. He says these are one and the same, that you can't separate the secular from the rest, or from the secular from the sacred. 
it's all happening at the same time. Debbie Thomas, who's a, she writes lectionary essays, said, what Jesus does say is far more subtle and complicated. The coin is already the emperor's. There's his face stamped right on it. So give it to him. But then consider the harder question. What belongs to God? What tribute do we owe God? Well, the Roman coins of Jesus' day bore the image of the emperor on them. But we know, as human beings created by God, we bear God's image. God's image is stamped in us. Like that coin, God's image is born in us, which means that what belongs to God is everything, all of us. There's no distinction between the secular and the sacred if everything belongs to God. So what does that mean for us then? This is the question that this story always leaves with me. If everything belongs to God, how do we give to God everything? It's complicated and it's difficult because we live in a world that for the most part is not <laughs> much like what God envisions God's world to be. If everything belongs to God, then our spiritual lives and the way we live in the world every day must align. So what belongs to God is our very being then. How we reflect God's image in the world around us in our families, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our churches, our schools. That is what it means to give everything to God. And it doesn't mean becoming someone else. You might think, oh, then I have to become something else in order to be that. It actually means becoming exactly who God created us to be, living into who God created us to be. Giving God what belongs to God is giving to God our very selves with open hearts, with curious minds, with willing spirits, and the desire to reflect God's image, God's grace, compassion, and love in the world around us in every way, on every day, and to continually grow in this understanding of ourselves and of God to nurture our relationship with God with the same care and devotion and intentionality that we nurture the relationships with other humans in our lives, with our spouses, our partners, our children, our friends. We put time and effort into those relationships. We communicate as part of those relationships to build trust as part of those relationships. We should be doing that with God as well. Now that may look different, giving our all, it may look different in different contexts, in the different spaces we occupy in the world, and the different circumstances that inform our lives in how we live out and show and reveal God's image to the world, but the root of it is the same. The root of that image is God's love for us and for every other human. And as we deepen our understanding of who we are as children of God, as those made in the image of God, often what we realize are there are some things we need to let go that aren't exactly like the image of God, because we are human. <laughs> so we carry lots of stuff with us. But we have to let go of the things that do not reveal the image of God to the world, the things that do not reflect God's joy, God's dream for this world, the things that get in the way prevent us from becoming who we are called to be more fully, getting rid of anger and pettiness, of pride and judgment, of divisiveness and prejudice, and all the things so that we can make room, make space for love and kindness and compassion for justice and peace in a world that is raging right now with very little of those things present. Again, the writer Debbie Thomas, she writes it so eloquently. She says, I see no path 
that sidesteps humility, surrender, and sacrificial love. I see no permission to secure my prosperity at the expense of another person's suffering. No evidence that truth-telling is optional. I see no kingdom that favors the contemptuous over the brokenhearted. We become more fully who God created us to be by giving to God what is God's. By giving to God our willingness to let go and to learn. By giving to God our courage to stand up for what's right and to stand beside those who are seeking justice. Our vulnerability, especially when times are difficult. The ability to say, I don't know but I'm here to learn, and I want to learn. And the ability to say, I love you, even to those that are hard to love for us. This is a time in the life of this community here at St. Andrews, a time of transition, to think about how you give to God what belongs to God. Times of transition can be hard and They can be amazing times of great learning and understanding and dreaming about who you are called to be as individuals and as a community in the world. It's a time to lean in, to discern how you can give to God what belongs to God and do it through and in this beautiful community of faithful people. What belongs to God and how will you give of yourselves here and in every context of your lives? It's a great question to ask and to ask all the time because we're always struggling, I think, between what is of God's and what this world offers us on any given day. When I was asking myself this question many years ago, I found the words of Henry Nouwen, the great Catholic priest and theologian. I think probably many of you have heard of Henry Nouwen so resonant. He was discerning a call, a transition about who and what he was called to be, where he was called to live, who he was called to serve. And he wrote down his joys and his struggles in a journal that he later published called The Road to Daybreak. And he wrote this, and it's in, I have a copy of this book that is dog-eared and pages are flipped down and written in. And you know how when you have a book like that that you love so much and, and when it, you put it out like this and it falls open to a particular page that's still kind of warm from the last time your eyes set on it? That's this book for me. And this is the page it always lands on. He said, I am growing in the awareness that God wants my whole life, not just part of it. It's not enough to give just so much time and attention to God and keep the rest for myself. To return to God means to return to God with all that I am and all that I have. I cannot return to God with just half of my being. God wants not just part of me, but all of me. Only when I surrender myself completely to God's love can I expect to be free ready to hear the voice of love and able to recognize my own unique call. I love that image that he presents to us there, giving to God what belongs to God. Notice that he says not surrender to God. He says surrender to God's love. And there is such expansive and wide open space in God's love for each and every one of us, for every one of God's creation. Surrendering ourselves to God's love helps us to open up, to see things differently, to see a world in need and find where we might be able to answer some of that need, to see friends in need and be able to sit and say, I don't know how to help you, but I'll sit right here with you. That's love. That is giving to God. That is a way to give to God what belongs to God, love and trust and compassion and peace. So let us give to God and give to the world God's love in such a way that God's love is what we reflect back when we meet someone new, when we see an old friend, when we encounter someone on the street. Amen.